many, many years have divided our understanding of what makes us all different into genetics and environment. The, first, the clip I showed you was one around nature. Our individual differences have to do with our genes. There's a genetic blueprint, it's our DNA, and it carries out what it's meant to do. And then the other side of it, which Clyde always went on about, he said, environment trumps genetics. He loved that word, trumps, is that it's all environmental. And so we're born as a blank slate, and the environment writes on it. And we now know that neither of those points of views are correct. And also, it's not correct to add the two together, to take, let's say, 40% of our individual differences in a trait are from the genes, and 60% are from the environment. And when you add them together, you get this. That's also not correct. Instead, there's an interplay between the genes and the environment. And Clyde spoke about this beautifully in the video, the beautiful video that CIFAR put together. So what do we mean by interplay? Well, one thing we mean is that our genes are actually listening to the environment and the experience that we have are changing, as Bruce said, um, the way our genes are expressing or functioning. So let's just go back. Now, why would Clyde have really been disturbed by this video? Because for many years, as an epidemiologist, he and his colleagues had realized that there was a biological embedding of experience, the term that he coined. And as Bruce said, whoops, sorry. There's two devices for me to control here. It makes it too challenging. Anyways, as Bruce said, if you have early experiences of abuse, neglect, this gives you a much higher chance, even if this happens only early in life, to have health risks. And so on average, kids are put on a developmental path or a developmental trajectory, and it's towards health, wellness, social functioning, well-being, and it is influencing, influenced by what happens to them early on. It's also important what happens later, but those early years are very critical. We want to know how to prevent these early experiences often associated with low socioeconomic status. And they reflect the gradient in health that Clyde talked about so often. And what's particularly interesting to me is that there are individual differences in this response. So some individuals, as I'm going to say, would be highly affected by this and others not. But overall, there are differences when you've had this adverse early experience in neural and endocrine responses to stress, as Bruce told us, in brain development, as we heard from Bruce, and also its function, and the immune system, and even the gut microbiome, the, the organisms that are in our gut. And we had a very interesting CIFAR meeting about that in the last two days. Now, Tom Boyce and Bruce Ellis put forward this idea that our children, when born, um, could be more like dandelions. If there is stress that they experience, they'll do okay. Just like a dandelion, they can grow in the cracks of the sidewalks whereas the orchid child needs to be watered and grown in the right humidity, and then they'll flourish. I, I asked Tom, how can I figure out if my kids are orchid or dandelion children? He said, just put really woolly socks on them, and the orchid kid runs around screaming, it's too itchy. I think I have two orchid kids. But so what, does, what do these ideas mean? This is something around gene by environment interactions. So if you know about the genetics, what genotype someone has for any given gene you might look at, the serotonin transporter, for instance, but there's many, many of them, we have two forms, one from our mother, one from our father, and in a population, we could end up getting two that are the same or two that are different. And so that's something we can read in our DNA. And if we only know that, it doesn't tell us what the response of that individual is going to be across the potential environments that an individual could experience. Whereas if we know about the environment, they grew up, let's say, with a lot of adversity in early life compared to very little adversity, that alone does not tell us how these individuals with two genotypes are going to act. So let's take, for example, this is the early adverse environment all the way to a very positive environment. And let's say we're measuring maternal sensitivity, how sensitive the mom is to the baby. This is something we've done as part of the MAVEN project with Allison Fleming and Michael Meany and others in the room. And we find that if we look at two genotypes, 
we find that one is like the dandelion. It, is, it does not respond to an early environment of adversity at all. It's always behaving in the same way in terms of the sensitivity as it gives that child as a parent. However, the other genotype is more like an orchid. It's highly affected when it has very adverse experience, when that mom is, grows up with abuse or neglect. And then when there's positive experience, there's a high sensitivity level for that mom. So we need to know both about the gene, the genetic architecture, and the environment, and there's an interplay. We can't know this whole story without knowing both, and this is what we mean by interaction. And these kind of graphs are really common, whether we look at my fruit flies and whether they have um, early nutritional adversity, whether they're going to be exploratory or not, whether they excrete a lot of poo. I mean, I could show you all kinds of exciting data about my flies today, but Sadly, I only have 10 minutes. So this is what gene by environment interaction is. Now, the other thing is epigenetics. These are two mechanisms whereby our experience can get embedded in our biology. And what you can think of in terms of epigenetics is that DNA is like books packed in boxes and stacked in a library. And that epigenetics change the likelihood that these, these DNA will be read, that the DNA will be read. And examples of factors that induce epigenetic changes are listed here. Social interactions, they're all here. Nutrition, smoking. And so that DNA, how it's read, how much it's going to be expressed or not, will depend on your experience. So this is what I mean by the genes are listening to the environment. And just in a very um, pictorial way, we see that when the uh, early environment is adverse, this DNA that wraps around other proteins in the chromatin, it's almost like it's covered up and it can't be read or expressed. And in these more positive environments, the DNA is easier to read. And in epigenetics, it's not turning on or off this gene expression. It's more like a dimmer switch that up or down regulates the capacity for that gene to express itself. And the work of many people in the room and others has shown that early adversity changes the likelihood that some genes will be um, read, just like Bruce said about the glucocorticoid receptor gene involved in stress, and that how we cope with stress, how our brain develops and works, and how we fight disease. Okay, so one quick example from Michael Meany and Moishe Ziff. We have a rat mom, and that mommy licks her pups a lot or a little. And so this is how it would work if this is epigenetic. We have the mom who licks a little bit, and the one who licks a lot, and these are her pups who get licked a little bit or a lot, but you can cross-foster them. And then ask the question, what happens with these guys when they have a biological mom that licks a lot, but their experience is to be licked a little bit? Do they end up being mothers that have to do with their biological background or their experience or some combination of both? And what they've shown is that it's the foster mom that matters. For, so for this glucocorticoid receptor, you can look at how much of the gene is expressed. What matters is the foster mom. So here we have the biological mom first, the foster mom second. And you see that when the foster mom is a high liquor and groomer, that baby grows up to be a high liquor and groomer of her pups. And so it's and then the opposite is true for the foster mom that's a low liquor and groomer. So somehow this parenting has been um, inherited in, in this means. What's the consequence of this? The mom's behavior, social context affects the lifelong health of the infants via later stress reactivity. The mom's behavior is transferred to the pups in an epigenetic manner. It's as though epigenetics is a mechanism for nurture. Changes to the epigenome are really a cellular memory of an environmental event. Now, epigenetics is in its infancy, and there's still many things that we don't know. Is it reversible? Is it transgenerational? Uh, we have some beautiful work from a new person in our child and brain development program, Elizabeth Binder, showing that the epigenetic machinery can interact with the DNA sequence variation to affect post-traumatic stress disorder. And then what are the consequences of all this for brain plasticity and lifelong health? So in our child and brain development program at CIFAR, these are the kind of questions that we are tackling. We know that early experience sets developmental trajectories for health behavior across a lifetime. How does this happen? 
We talk today about gene environment interactions. We bring with us predispositions to behave a certain way, but our environment writes on our DNA and changes it through, the, uh, through changing expression. When, when do these positive environment impact, um, inputs matter? Or when are the adverse ones um, causing problems? So this whole idea of critical or sensitive periods in development, windows of opportunity where the brain needs that stimulation in order to develop in an optimal way. We're very interested in studying that. What early experiences matter is a huge issue. If one compares a slow drip of neglect, how is that different than one or two instances of abuse? We, we don't really know the answers to questions like that. And then where? Should we be only looking at the brain? We know now that the brain and the body are having conversations, and so we want to ask questions about that. And finally, all of this work comes together to answer the question, which hopefully many of us will talk about today, how can we make a difference and help every child reach their potential? Okay, great. <laughs>